Rock is lit. Confidential. It's kind of one of those instances where I think there was a culmination of things that were going on and then the extra, the extra pressure of going to the United States to do a like a press junket for their album. Holy Bible was might have been something that kind of put him over the top. He was a uh, he was uh, that's my dog. You're hey. not making an appearance. Um is it him? Is it the spirit of Richie? He has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what's happened? Whoa, yeah. we get the exclusive interview with him. This is cool. That's so funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, he I, I think what happened is that the that the final pressure of him going to the States to do the the press junket for Holy Bible just put him over the top. He was one of these characters that that was he apparently he wasn't you know an accomplished mu musician necessarily but he had a great vision he was a, a good designer and he was a lyricist for the band and he also suffered from uh from mental health issues he was a, a known cutter and he spoke about it in in interviews that he felt a certain command or control of his emotions when he uh when he cut and which i've always i found interesting that's such a Mm -hmm. people that are are super into pain and then i guess not um, coincidentally he right he, he presented to the band an idea of a new album that would be a combination of pantera and nine inch nails and kind of fits in with that i know a lot of cutters that love nine inch nails and mm -hmm. that kind of makes sense to me i love the, the idea though, of trying to combine those two bands and and his band you know um man street preachers are like i don't know if we're going to be able to deliver that vision for you because we're not, I mean, Pantera is one hell of a band. I mean, that is one raging metal band and, mm. and, uh, and yeah, he just, he, he apparently wrote a kind of uh prophetic message to his sister and included a Sylvia Plath uh, poem Tulips. about tulips. Right. Yeah. And, and then he, he checked into hotel and then he disappeared and his car was found not too far from a bridge, a location where people were known to, you know, to jump. And what was odd was like a week after he disappeared and it, it became a news item, a fan recognized him on the street and said they had a full on conversation with him. But this this fan didn't know that he was missing. And that was that one. And and they you know, I mean, eyewitness accounts are always challenging. And yes. Um, but that did seem to be somewhat credible that he, he may have been out for a week or two while he was missing and then, you know, probably, uh, um, committed suicide. And it's that, that one's like many, they're frustrating because they just, there's no closure for the family. And it does seem like a lot of the, a lot of the angles are pointing toward him doing himself harm because it, there were just too many things kind of building up. And so, yeah, it most likely happened that way that he, he just did himself in. Didn't and they have him? They went, the family went ahead and declared him presumed dead in 2008, I think. It took a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, um, over 10 years is really frustrating. So, Cater, didn't you come across some information that indicated that he had relatives who've done this sort of thing before? Yes. I believe I read about him having an uncle that went off the grid for about 10 years and who kind of came back and decided to start teaching again, decided that that's what he wanted to do and 
Richie always kind of looked up to him for that. He always talked about that and sort of respected his ambition to just go off and disappear. Mm. Okay, so there was some history there with family that it, it wouldn't be unprecedented if he did decide to just split rather than commit suicide. How did his fans react when the news first broke that he was missing? I think people took it pretty hard. And what's what's interesting, what I love about British bands, especially from that period, from like the late 80s into the late 90s, is they... There were sometimes there was a there was a character in the band. There's a, a guy named Bez who was in the Happy Mondays. And here in the United States, we might consider him a mascot because he provided percussion. And but most importantly, Bez just danced. He danced like a lunatic on stage at the Happy Mondays. Every show never fails. And Bez partied harder than anybody. A guy, well, I mean, I the legend is. And here we don't really understand it, but I think in the in the UK they become a representation of the audience on the stage. Oh, where, wow. Okay. Where, and I think it was similar with Richie because he, he was a, he was a roadie for the band. He, he just worshiped Manic Street Preachers. And then eventually his dedication to the band and his, his excellence as a writer uh, helped him become the, the main lyricist and uh, singer and sort of front person for the, uh, for the band for that period of time, for whatever that was, four or five years. And, and that's what's really exciting. And I think that's why fans and and people in the UK really take it hard because a guy like, if Bez were, to, I think Bez is still alive um, and is considered like the soul of the Happy Mondays along with Sean Ryder. And I think that it was similar for Richie that that he he kind of lived out a dream that a lot of people would, I mean, like, like, like Christy, you like, imagine like suddenly you became the guitar tech for Jimmy Page. I mean, it's oh the, my God, it's the, same, <laughs> it's the same idea. Like where that doesn't happen in American bands in general. Like, you don't like Kurt Cobain was a huge Mud Honey fan. And he, I think he did, uh, he teched for them for a while or carried, you know, was a, um, was running around the band with them and a Oh, and I think, um, Melvins, the Melvins. The Melvins. You yeah. love the Melvins. And I think he he worked more with that for them. And and Buzz was like, you just gotta start your own band. And it's it's similar where I think a lot of people really identified with Richie and and they took it pretty hard because he was he was the the representation of the audience on stage in the band. And to have him mm. kind of implode like that was just gut wrenching. Well, it is interesting that when he disappeared, he was 27. So one way or another, he has joined that club. Mm -hmm. Boo. And <laughs> Terrible yeah. club. Sorry. And coincidentally, I think he disappeared around the same time that Kurt Cobain uh, committed suicide. Okay. And they were kind of linked in a sort of uh, representation, like the poet for pains, sort mm -hmm. of. And just like having young people empathize with what they were saying in their lyrics. Cater, you are a fan of Connie Converse. And right. she was a, a 50s and 60s singer-songwriter. I'll let you give more information about her in a second. But she disappeared in 74. So give me a little background on her. Yeah, so Connie Converse is sort of a almost a van gogh type figure where didn't get a lot of attention in her own time but went on to inspire just countless artists and songwriters she came up in new york city in the 50s just playing for friends and in various cafes and establishments and she was just a really really gifted in terms of melody and structuring songs and poetic lyricism she's a really mm. gifted folk singer that was probably about 10 years ahead of her time in terms of the folk explosion in new york city with the right. likes of dylan and joan baez but people nowadays like angel olsen who lives in Nashville, and adrian linker big thief cite her as one of their biggest influences but the probably most famous thing about her is her disappearance, which happened in 74. After years of trying to sell her music, she moved to Ann Arbor, became a writer and an editor. And about after 10 years of doing that, 
her life just wasn't going well. She didn't feel accomplished and she fell into a deep depression, drank and smoked heavily. Her friends and family tried to help her with her mood by traveling and trying to be of support. But she had kind of reached a point where she decided that she wanted to head out and make a new life. And she said that she was going to go make a new life in New York City and return to the place where she was performing a lot. But in 1974, she wrote a bunch of handwritten letters to her friends and family. You can read a lot of those online if you're interested in reading those. She's a very poetic writer, even in letters. And she was never heard from again. She took off in her Volkswagen bug, which we talked about as sort of the calling card of the disappeared musician, (laughs) is that you got to disappear in a Volkswagen. Just leave all your stuff. And... She was never heard from again, and it sort of became this big mystery that people talk about. There was a big New York Times article about it, Hmm. I think, last year. And, yeah, I've been a fan of her for a while. Me and my girlfriend listen to her a lot. I was going to ask you about that, because how did that get started? I think we read the New York Times article about her. She actually sent it to me and was like, you know, I'm a big folk fan and a big Bob Dylan fan. Mm -hmm. And they sort of had this connection there's actually a lot of people in the article talking about how she's a much better version of all these folk artists that came after her wow and yeah it's really interesting and i think her stuff has aged really well should there's a compilation of all of her songs on spotify or any streaming that should check out if you're interested in that so she recorded a bunch of stuff but she never did get a record deal no, I think they're all pretty much live recordings or oh, okay. some from her friends. You can hear chatter from her friends around. Oh, okay. I love that idea that that she has these kind of live um, recordings. I love that cater where like yeah, like we can hear people in the background, and it makes it seem like, I it makes it seem like you're there or you're you're kind of listening in on something you shouldn't, mm-hmm. and it's at its cool or like you're uh, you're traveling back in time and you're plopped down right next to her, you know, it's not, there's nothing prefabricated about it. Like when you go into a studio and there's, it's just pure. I I think that's really Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff said something in part one about some artists just losing their sense of destiny and just deciding to, to disappear in one form or another. And it kind of sounds like she's a prime candidate for that theory that she, her career was not, working out she wasn't having any success and Mm -hmm. you know maybe she just decided well we don't know we really don't know if she killed herself or if she just moved away and started over but in any event she'd be almost 100 years old right now she was born in 1924 so it's highly unlikely that she's still alive so i guess we'll never know no it's always a tragedy when someone is ahead of their time and they can't be appreciated for that because they are, you know, by definition, don't fit in that time period. So you mentioned VWs. We're going to talk about another person who disappeared in a VW, Jim Sullivan. I first heard about him a few months ago, and I don't remember how or, or where but I just remember being struck by his story. And he was this psychedelic mm-hmm. folk singer songwriter and he was in LA trying to make a go of it. And he actually did make a couple of albums. The first one was called UFO and it came out in 1969. And he was a big UFO extraterrestrial person. He would go out to the desert sometimes and, and try, to, try to encounter UFOs. And his wife was a believer as well. But he was hanging out in Hollywood with people like Dennis Hopper. He had an uncredited appearance in Easy Rider. But like with Connie, he just couldn't make that leap to stardom. It just wasn't working out. So what do you guys know about Jim Sullivan? I think I I read something where he had a a great A&R rep, I think. Was he signed? It might have been A&M. I can't remember who it is now. But I think it was A and M. Was it A and M? They did everything they could. It was one of the situations where they, I think they put a, a it, the recording budget was ridiculous, and it, it's man, I I don't know. It's such an interesting, uh, 
strategy when you when someone is new especially then like back when that um like early 70s late 60s you really didn't need to spend that much money and you had time to build uh, an artist like over four albums maybe uh, maybe something like that now it's i mean well going into the 80s and 90s is a little different but when you spend that kind of money there's so much pressure and and I mean, some, I've done that before where you throw everything at it and you go, this is going to be amazing. And, it, and you lose a lot of the uh, the uh, the magic that's in the demo. That That's very common where a band will have some something amazing. It's just some there's just something untangible uh, aspect about the recording and on this demo. And then you go in and you record and you, you know, you you bring in all the heavy hitters and it just doesn't happen. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very common. And I think that was the argument with, with Sullivan that, that there was something that, that got, that just got muddied when they went big and, you know, just brought in everything they possibly could to, to make this a big hit and it didn't happen. And that's gotta be so frustrating for an artist when, when you, you're like, well, well, you know, I, we tried everything, you know, we, yeah. we brought it, we brought mm -hmm. in it all. And, and this didn't happen. I went, I listened to UFO again and it's so weird. I mean, it, it's such a funny, it, it, I see, I can totally understand why it didn't, it didn't go over because it is completely unique. It doesn't sound like anything. And I it, really it was, like it though. I like it's that. Cool. I don't, yeah, I'm not exactly. I'm not putting it down, but, but like it, it, it's, it, if you were the, if you were the radio um, sales guys, uh, that like Charlie Minor, I don't know if he was there in the early or the early seventies, but it would have been hard for someone like him to try and sell that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like when you listen to it, where do you, you know, it would it would probably be big on on like public radio, like that would be a place where I would go with that album, uh, you know, because I just don't hear it among you know bread or, <laughs> or whatever, or like you know, <laughs> like whatever the you know the the Baby, song. Baby, I'm you know, won't they, you. <laughs> yeah, just you know, I can't live, or you know, whatever the song might be. Like, <laughs> right? It doesn't it doesn't fit any of the formats? So I see why it tanked. You're just like, what do you do with it? It's so weird. I think with Jim Sullivan, especially, uh, he was sort of like the all American like winner growing up. He was like the high school okay. football captain oh, who ended I didn't up that. okay, who ended up marrying like the prom queen. You know, he was very used to success and accolades success, i guess you right. could say yeah. and but was also very committed to music and really wanted to make it and still did up to his disappearance it seems yeah because he was headed for nashville well back up a little bit he and his wife started having trouble because he was hitting the bottle pretty hard when things mm -hmm. didn't go well with the career he he's turns to alcohol and there's some friction in the marriage and and he decides that he's going to go to Nashville, make a new start. But I, from what I read, he, he, he didn't intend to break up the family. He just wanted to go. Yeah. He just wanted to go see what he could do and bring the family out. So it's, it doesn't make sense to me that he would set all that up and then go kill himself. But we don't know what happened to him. He was in the Arizona, no, it was the New Mexico desert, and his car was found with his guitar in it. I don't know if his wallet or other belongings were in it, but the guitar was in it, and that was a tip-off to close friends who said, oh, no, he would never leave his guitar. But his body mm -hmm. was never found. We just, we don't know what happened to him either. Skinwalkers. Yep, oh. yep. I found it interesting last time we talked. I think you brought up the Manson connection, Nathan, because you well, know he was that, just that. Yeah, if he was around those guys in the late, in like sixty eight, sixty nine, he probably ran. You know, ran bumped into that crew. Not that, but like mm -hmm. you were pointing out that there weren't that many people left on the ranch. Most were in jail by that time. Oh yeah, yeah. The ranch actually burned down in seventy seventy one. So oh, they yeah. had yeah, yeah they yeah. had dispersed, but. That's interesting. He maybe he did associate with some of those folks before they were arrested. The the mob is listed as some as some a possible re reason. Did we ever figure out like why? <laughs> you know, did he owe money or something? Was he a gambler or was he was the album uh, funded by the mob or something? That's kind of but and the, yeah. it, that, I don't know. That's I think we said before. Like the mob wouldn't kill you in general for that. They would. I mean they they want their money back and it, it would make sense to keep him alive 
a little longer to try and get their money back through a new album or something to just, unless he did something else that had nothing to do with, you know, lending money, like, you know, which is possible. But I just mm -hmm. found that odd that that was listed part of the wiggy, like Gooby the Bomb. Right. Well, Cater, tell us about the phone call that he made. Wasn't it to his wife when he got to New Mexico? That's right. I think a big reason people believe that there's some sort of connection with mob or aliens or something like that interfering oh, is because, aliens. yeah, the mob or aliens <laughs> uh, is uh, the phone call that he had is with his wife. It was about a day after he left for Nashville. You know, he has these plans. He wants to make money selling songs and bring his family down. But a day out, he calls his wife very cryptically and says, hey, everything is fine. And his wife's confused because why would why there wouldn't be anything he? wrong? Why would yeah. it be fine? And she asks him what's wrong. And he says, you wouldn't believe if I told you. Ooh. Which is a very just open-ended, cryptic thing to say about. Yeah, pretty so, ominous. Yeah, it's almost like he knew he was either in danger or he was going through something very strange. We don't know. But after that, yeah, he he got pulled over for on suspicion of intoxicated driving by a police officer. But he passed that sobriety test, so... We don't know the situation there either. Mm -hmm. He checked into a hotel. Apparently, he didn't even use the beds. All the sheets were still tucked in. And then they found that Volkswagen with uh, also symbolically, as well as his guitar, two of his records, the two records he produced. Oh, made, wow. Like in a box. It's almost like he was leaving all that behind. And the pressures of those two records kind mm. of along with his guitar and papers and money and clothes. Well, you know, something else that that I think is interesting, there are the lyrics, some of the lyrics in that album, UFO, reference disappearing. Mm. Not only do they reference UFOs, but they reference just disappearing. So I don't know. I mean, it just, it seems strange to me that he would, kill himself so he either i think he either died in the desert and the animals got him or somebody killed him and buried him i, I think that's makes more sense to me than suicide mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Maybe he, I mean, I don't know if he was into psychedelics, but he could have just kind of gotten lost out there after a bad trip. Hey, have you seen the cover of UFO? He was into <laughs> psychedelics. Uh, he did make some pretty psychedelic <laughs> Hells yeah. Tried to talk to the aliens and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to mispronounce this next person's name. And she is yet another one that I had never heard of. Christina Licorice McKechnie or McKechnie. Is she Scottish? Mm. Do we? Is she she Scottish? is from Edinburgh. Yes. Okay. So she played with the Incredible String Band and they were at Woodstock in 69. But she's another one who is thought to have disappeared in the desert. 1990, but in the desert... I, I don't think she had a VW. I think she was hi hitchhiking or something. That's right. <laughs> but did we ever find out why they called her licorice? You know, I didn't really look into that. I guess maybe she was very sweet. <laughs> oh, oh. oh. <laughs> da, 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 yeah, yeah, too bad. Ugh, oh, yeah. sweet person. So Incredible String Band were sort of a, a hippie collective of musicians that if you listen to them, it's very st stuck in that era of flower children, the 60s movement and the Woodstock era, obviously. So she was uh, part of that movement. She was from Edinburgh. She was uh, an adventurous spirit. And she kind of ran away from home like a lot of girls in the 60s did to go marry a musician. And then she left that musician for another musician. And this musician, Robin Williamson, 
started the incredible string band and said, Hey, I'm going to bring you into this. And she became an important member of that band. She was the percussionist and the background singer. Mm. And she was on that stage at Woodstock. Um, she actually disappeared a while after the band sort of fell apart. They fell apart in sort of 1974. She left the band two years earlier and sort of became a wanderer after that point. Uh, was known for hitchhiking across the Arizona desert and didn't really her family heard from her occasionally the last time she was heard from was from her sister she was apparently recovering from a surgery and she was communicated with her sister but do you know what disappeared. year that was i believe it was 1990 the same year she okay. disappeared and yeah she disappeared in 1990 uh somewhere in the arizona desert a lot of people think she just wandered out i mean a lot of people think that there's a lot of dangers associated with hitchhiking. And I can't believe she's still hitchhiking in 1990. Right. You know, who very... does that? Who does that anymore? Yeah, uh, definitely heightened danger if she's she's doing that. Yeah. And I think uh, a member of her band said there's a possibility she may be dead. Just mm -hmm. might have been a tragic disappearance. But some people uh, theorize that the incredible string band's connection with Scientology had something to do with it. That's sort of like the, the mob or aliens or Manson family connection that we kind of yeah. have to force on it because the, some of the band did dabble in Scientology apparently before it had its reputation that it did now and had its reputation for making people disappear. So it's, it's a it is a mysterious case just because she's not very documented in terms of what she was doing during that time. Okay. So we don't know if there was any reason that she would want to disappear. We don't know any motivation. Okay. Well, uh, I guess she'll stay a mystery too. How old is she? Or how old would she be if she was alive? Um, be in her seven, yeah, seventies. Okay. Uh -huh. This is the most, this next person is the most bizarre thing that you came up with. Cater did a lot of research on this and posted it. And I read it before we did the interview. This is about Jim Morrison. Okay. Now we all know he supposedly died in a bathtub in Paris in 1971. And there's a lot of different thoughts out there about how he died, whether it was a heart attack or drugs or murder or even. Well, mm -hmm. Cater, you came up with some information that said Jim Morrison actually is still alive and possibly living in Oregon, and his name is Bill Boyer. Please tell me about that. Sure thing. So I was having trouble finding stuff on this, but eventually I stumbled on a great conspiracy theory website that had just all this information and great pictures of Bill Boyer, who is apparently... Jim Morrison now and Jim Morrison's face and them transitioning into each other. It's a great layout, a lot of discussion in the forum. And so the theory is he faked his death and he moved to an isolated ranch in the Oregon desert under the name Bill Boyer. And if you look up the name Bill Boyer, you can look at this sort of old guy in a cowboy hat in this picture I'm looking at, he's holding a shotgun and a pistol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he looks like a guy from a ranch in Oregon, but he's got sort of this face that people think looks a lot like an aged Jim Morrison with the kind of strong nose and the chin. And a lot of people have thought that it's him. I think the, the, the death of Jim Morrison has a lot of questions surrounding it. There's a lot yeah. of theories about, a lot of hearsay about where he actually died. Like, was it, did they bring him into the bathroom after he died in a club? A lot of people say that. Uh, and there was no autopsy performed on Jim Morrison. Mm -hmm. So his official cause of death was heart attack. But he was on drugs at the time. And a lot of people reasonably say it's an overdose, but we can't be sure. Uh, there's a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding Jim Morrison, also because of his father, who was a very powerful person 
in the he, navy yeah he was a rear admiral yeah he had a lot of control and okay yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so nathan tell me a little bit more about i think you said the last time we talked you had seen a documentary about the last days of jim morrison I've seen a ton of stuff. I'm, I'm, Kate, I'm looking at this right now. The uh, the Bigfooty.com is awesome. I, <laughs> I, I love it. I love a good conspiracy theory. Or about this. Oh, What's funny is that he looks more like Bill Graham than he does Jim Morrison. I think <laughs> kind of funny. What's interesting is like when you see when you see Jim's face, especially in 1971, it it became more it became more puffy. Like he yeah. he lost the <laughs> he lost the deep. Uh, cheekbones and the the uh, the um, uh, the cheeks the way the cheeks kind of pock in like it's interesting though the the guy they chose as Bill Boyer character it's awesome uh, yeah. there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of information about now about the last uh, the last two days of his life and um, it's it's just really sad I mean it sounds like that he he most likely had emphysema and he was, he was showing a lot of signs of someone with early emphysema and he, he was the, the problem that probably the worst thing for him was Pamela, his common law wife was addicted to heroin and she was a mess. And she, I'm not, and I'm not blaming it on her at all. Just that they were together. Those two it was a toxic, you know, they were a toxic couple and they didn't bring out the best in each other. And where she did kind of get him away from, uh, you know, the, the, the classic drinking buddies that he had down there on Santa Monica Boulevard. The problem was, is that he still partied just as hard with, with her and then was getting into heroin mm -hmm. and he wouldn't, he wouldn't shoot it, but he would sniff it from time to time. And the, the owner of the rock and roll circus, which was the club that he was frequenting to get her heroin uh, admitted near his death that they that he OD'd in the bathroom. He, I don't think he was, or he was close to death or near dead or dead. Uh, I don't think they knew, but he OD'd in the bathroom and the two dealers that sold him the, the heroin took him outside. And then I think they got him to uh, Pamela, to their flat. And then, um, and then he, he might've been, you know, that's what's murky is we don't know if that he was alive or dead when he most likely got to that flat the uh the club owner said that he was he was dead in his opinion but you never really know in those cases he might have been clinging to life but we they it is pretty well known that she she rushed the and uh, she rushed a you know a big payment to paralyzed chaise and got him buried among all these poets and edith piaf and these great performers chopin is there oscar and wilde oscar wilde yeah it's a it's a perfect place for him yeah and and they rushed it in. The, and the problem was, like you're saying, Cater, is that Bill Siddons, their manager, was very young. He he was in his early 20s when he became he was their road manager and then became their manager. And he was so freaked out when he arrived because Pamela was crying and just in hysterics that he never opened the casket. He never saw Jim, which leads to this whole <laughs> these awesome yeah. you know, ideas that he went to Africa or that yeah, he's Bill Boyer or whoever it might be. But it does it does look pretty much like that he all these again, like kind of like Richie, there's all these signs that point to this because there was a notorious and in, incredibly pure bad batch of heroin that went around in northern France that killed all these people. And that was part of the batch that killed both um, Pamela's lover, the guy that got him the heroin. Um, this uh, I'm forgetting his name. He was a he was he was royalty of, of, in count? some distant way. And what? he he knew these dealers and he was most likely behind the heroin that killed him. And it ended up killing him also. Mm. And um, what's interesting is that Keith Richards was quoted as saying, I feel so lucky that we were in the South of France and that we had a different connection. We were going through these um, Corsican guys and his Corsican connection, you know, kept them with pretty solid heroin and, and they never had a problem while all these people in, in Northern France died and that's so again like all these all these different um arrows are pointing to that fact that he probably snorted it up he had emphysema he was in a really bad state he was already incredibly pure heroin and he just died and it just it's such a like a cliche and frustrating way and i'm so happy like as a fan that 
they created this whole, you know, aura and allure of mystery around oh, it yeah. because it made it a lot more interesting than just another guy, you know, ODing on, on drugs, which sucks. And, uh, I don't know, it definitely, you know, it, it just adds to the mystery and to the, to the, the whole, the whole, uh, I, I guess, yeah, just the interesting aspect about the band and the, again, like he was obsessed with sex and death and, and, uh, it just it's it's fun as a fan because around uh, around LA there's all these great sites that you can you mm -hmm. can experience whether it's down in Venice or it's in West Hollywood the various places you live there with Pamela uh, or the the Alta Cienega Hotel where you can you can rent a, a really cheesy <laughs> motel room that's covered in graffiti and and have fun with your partner or whatever. It, there's a lot of fun things you can do because of this fact that they they solidified a mystery and then they buried him in this absolutely perfect place in yeah. Père Lachaise. And it's so fun to, if you, anybody listening, if you ever get a chance to to go to that cemetery in Paris, definitely do it. I mean, it's a beautiful cemetery anyway, but you've got to go see his grave. It's, there are always a lot of really interesting characters hanging around. It's a fun place to visit. And it's got the it's got those classic concert um, you know gates the uh, yep the you know, the barriers they put up at at uh, festival concerts or, or anywhere there's you know a serious event going on like for crowd control <laughs> it's, it's so awesome the guy's dead and they still have crowd control at his grave I just I love that <laughs> I just think it's so funny like that is no I mean no one is that hardcore no one is no one rocks that hard <laughs> that they have to like maintain peace at his grave you're like right on it's just awesome but right before we jumped on the zoom call i came across this article from 2016 i can't remember where it's from but uh it was claiming that jim is alive and living as a homeless hippie in new york and his name is richard so mm. you know nice. next time you go to new york be on the lookout for, for richard right there's a lot of good information too about the fbi at the time because they had they had dossiers on on Hendrix, on uh, Jim Morrison, Janice. They were following all of them and mm -hmm. tapping their phones. I don't know. It's it's an it's such an interesting time. But those there's a lot of information that's coming out now about how they were how they were being uh, trailed, and the FBI was was up you know up in their business for sure. Wow, these are all great stories, and the whole myth of the reclusive rock star or the rock star that disappears, all of the lore is fascinating to me. Thanks so much. No problem. You bet. All right. Uh, Bye. See you, later. see you guys. Thank you.